This is the Everything 80s Podcast, Episode 5, The Story of New Coke, Brand Failure or Strategic Brilliance. There's never been a better taste. There's never been a better Coke. Introducing the greatest taste discovery in a hundred years. Introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola. A taste that is Coke and everything a Coke means. A taste that's very familiar, yet totally new. A taste so good, so real, it couldn't be anything but a Coke. The great new taste of Coke. Watch for it, try it, and enjoy the best tasting Coke ever. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast, brought to you by everything80spodcast.com. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out. And welcome to probably what's my favorite topic as far as not just from like a 1980s pop culture standpoint, but from a, a marketing and commercial aspect. And it's the story of new Coke. So every time you pick up a can of Coke today, I don't know if you realize what you're holding actually had to be reintroduced and spent a little while as what was called new Coke. So if you're like, I don't know, I guess under 30 or 25, unless you've read up about this in marketing classes, you, you probably don't inter- like understand like the whole process um, that happened to get us to where Coca-Cola is today. So just as a quick summary, new Coke came out in 1985 and it was a response to really dwindling Coca-Cola sales. So it was used to replace the classic formula, but was met with so much consumer backlash that within three months, the original formula was returned and then rebranded as Coca-Cola classic. So this caused a spike in sales and it made a lot of people wonder if this was the plan all along. So we're going to look deeper into this, but just before, in case you haven't, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcasts. I should be there. Okay, time for New Coke. So let's set the stage for what happened with New Coke. And that means just like a quick little history on the development of what can be considered one of the most famous beverages ever created by mankind. And, you know, you've had Coke at various points. You might have had different versions from like, Diet Coke, Coke Zero, Cherry Coke, Vanilla Coke, Coke Life. Um, they're even introducing, I think it's to come out earlier in the year, this year, 2019. It's going to be called Coca-Cola Orange Vanilla. <clears throat> and it's I'm trying to get on like more into the flavored beverages when that's been a bigger thing. And But like over the years, they've done some crazy stuff like... Um, not bad was like Coca-Cola with lemon, you know, Coca-Cola with lime. I don't know if you've ever had Coca-Cola Black spelt with a K, B-L-A-K. It was a coffee-flavored version. I actually tried this at a food show, and it was awesome, like really good, and it just didn't It didn't get a mainstream release. There is Coca-Cola Citra. They did their own version of an orange before. They did Coca-Cola Ginger, Coca-Cola Light, spelt with a T. Just a ton of different variations over the years. Some of these would be available in select countries or short times or whatever. But like, as I was saying, Coke is one of a handful of beverages that has really had a massive impact on mankind, uh, especially from a, a commercial marketing aspect. It's probably top. But like, if you're looking at these things, there's drinks that they call, you know, kind of world shapers and, or shifters, and they've changed society and cultures, things like coffee or tea, beer, wine, things like that. There's a really amazing book called A History of the World in Six Glasses. And it takes a look at all these beverages and the significant cultural and societal changes that happen with each of them and how they shape the progression of humans. A beer is probably the most interesting. And it's considered that we have, <clears throat> one of the theories is that we have societies and, um, you know, that the concept of cities and villages and everything like that because of beer, because people needed to be closer together and banded into communities to grow it and produce it and consume it and trade it. And that it was one of the things that led to actual cultures and groupings of people. Like it's really amazing stuff. So definitely check that book out. But Coca-Cola itself has had a global impact for better or for worse and has reached every single corner of the globe. It's probably, you know, up there with the few most recognized brands on earth and probably the most heavily advertised, like I've traveled quite a bit. 
I've been in some of the most remote parts of the world like that have had no running water, electricity, any sort of infrastructure, but you'll see Coke signs everywhere and you can still buy it everywhere. It's, it's, it's crazy. And then on the flip side, there's, you know, all the health damage that's happened with it. And they've played a big role in hiding health information from us and, you know, influencing studies and manipulating data. It's pretty ridiculous company when you look about it or look at it all. Um, if you if you check out the show notes today, I'll link. It's it's basically the whole blog, the whole article. It's got uh, lots of pictures, and I've got some links to other things like uh, another podcast, a health related podcast on kind of like the corruption of Coca Cola and stuff like that. And you can see that by going to everything eighties podcast dot com slash five, and that's where everything is down there. And if you're listening on YouTube, there'll be a link below in the description box. So. Looking back, Coca-Cola was first created by a guy named John Pemberton, and he fought in the Civil War and was wounded. And at the time, they used morphine for pain. So he wanted to get off the morphine and started looking for a substitute for the drug. So he created, that's that's really at the origins of Coca-Cola, he created the first version in a drugstore, but it was more of a a Coca wine, which was really popular in Europe and kind of brought that concept over. And that was in 1885. So he registered this French wine kind of nerve tonic, he called it, with its original intent uh, to, you know, be a substitute for pain or it, like that tonics were a big thing back then just to relieving of ailments and stuff like that. But <clears throat> prohibition hits. So that forces him to create a non-alcoholic version. So it was sold as a medicine, basically along with carbonated water, which also at the time, the carbonated water was considered to be very good for your health. So popularity grows very quick, but it was hard to expand. Like transporting the new beverage seemed impossible, and then there was no way to con- like guarantee it to have a consistent flavor. And this is where bottling comes in, and the advancement of that process helped to grow Coke into the powerhouse it's now become. So they first started bottling it in 1894. And this was also the time when the very first advertisements were displayed. And then, you know, Coca-Cola and advertising just go hand in hand. And, but, you know, and at the same time, they've created some of the most iconic advertisements and commercials in history. Uh, They've given us the modern iteration of Santa Claus, like, you know, the red and white robes, the, the rosy cheeks, him being more plump and jolly. That's all, like, if you look at the original uh, images of Santa, it's nothing like that. Coca-Cola basically created that image that we have of Santa now. You know, other massive commercials like I Want to Buy the World a Coke. Uh, If you watch Mad Men, that's in the finale. It's amazing kind of full circle of, like, the creation of that commercial, even though it's fictional. But um, the... The Mean Joe Green, like they've just been like the Christmas commercials as well as the Santa thing. They've just been, you know, a real part of the fabric of our culture. Without going too much into the the history of Coke, you might wonder where the name Coca-Cola comes from. And it's based on a few of the ingredients. And the first is the cola nut. These are like the original ingredients. So cola nut is spelt with a K, K K-O-L-A. And that gives it part of its distinct flavor. Also gives it gives it the caffeine content. Uh, then the coca of cola comes from the coca leaf, which gives it <laughs> what was considered <clears throat> the cocaine. When you always heard that idea that the original Coke contained cocaine, it's not entirely true because cocaine is derived from coca leaves, but the original formula only, like because they used the leaves, it only can contain trace amounts. So technically it did. But you can use, like, if you travel through South America or whatever, you can get coca leaf tea and things like that. And it can ward off, like, altitude sickness and has a ton of health benefits, a lot of antioxidants, stuff like that. So indirectly, it contained a little bit of cocaine only because of the, um, the them using the leaves. It wasn't like they added cocaine right into the thing. So in 1980, or sorry, 1904, they went to using what are called spent coca leaves. That means there's no trace of any residual cocaine or anything like that. They're basically used today. What they use is a, a cocaine free coca leaf extract. 
And the whole thing, like the formula is still considered a pretty guarded secret. And there's always this idea that only two people know the whole thing. I don't know if it goes that far, but whatever. Uh, So it's hard to think of Coke as not being on top of the soft drink market. I mean, today a little more, like where there's more of um, a concern for health and there's more alternatives, whether they're uh, diet products or more like sparkling water based or whatever. But they, you know, they've always been king of soft drinks and cola. And, you know, even with the huge amount of competition, you know, it, it goes up and down, but they've always been on top and it, it still can be hard to stand out. And, you know, people now are more aware of the sugar and the extra crap they're getting and whatever. But like Coke's had market share trouble for years. We, uh, they haven't been the the king of the mountain, the top of the mountain. This goes actually far back as a second world war where they only had 60% of the market share, which is really good, but everyone's always under the assumption that they dominated the entire market. So now we're getting into the eighties and by 1983, it had dropped to 24%, which is ridiculous. And this is where the whole story of new Coke starts. So Pepsi, I mean, if you grew up during this time, you are probably very aware of the Pepsi Coke Wars, which have always happened, but they, this is when they were really ramped up because Pepsi was getting really aggressive in its advertising and taking a huge chunk out of the market. And they were actually outselling Coke in supermarkets just straight up. And it was only for uh, what kept Coke going was vending machines and fountain sales and fast food restaurants. This was like amazing foresight or potential luck that they jumped into the fast food market, like say with McDonald's as McDonald's was growing, you know, they probably couldn't foresee how big a company McDonald's would, would be. So they kind of went hand in hand and that's what kept Coke going and was allowing them to stay competitive. Um, and then along with this comes the sugar issue. So the eighties, again, I I recommend like checking out the the podcast. I run a a health related fitness nutrition podcast and I've linked that article up, but um, on the show notes today. So everything eighties podcast.com slash five. And this is the eighties is seen as a real turning point in our health. It's when harmful ingredients like trans fats uh, were introduced more. They they'd been around for a while, but now they become a little more common. Same thing with high fructose corn syrup. And they're starting to get more, um, they're given the ability to make fast food and junk food more affordable. You And you can almost see this direct correlation between the advent of junk and um, sodas and everything like that and the increasing rate of diabetes and obesity. And the thing with high fructose corn syrup was uh, it was incredibly cheap to produce because sugar tariffs were higher and importing fees and all that stuff. And they found out that they can make this stuff themselves at home for all, honestly like next to nothing. So manufacturers can now make larger bottles and serving sizes without any real cost to them. So they can kind of like, you know, push away the competition. And it's why you started seeing um, these bigger size drinks over the years. Uh, the, the consumer, like we thought we we're getting a bargain now. Well, we were, but kind of at the cost to our health. So this is when the big gulp is, uh, was really pushed on people and it starts to take off and has some more success. The big gulp from seven 11, it was, it was introduced in the late seventies and, but in the eighties became more prominent and then became cheaper because of high fructose corn syrup. And then it's why, like if you looked at an old can of Coke, you know, they're smaller and thinner and you couldn't buy super large size bottles in the eighties. This starts happening. You start seeing the, the growth and size of all these products. So, the thing is, because of people's awareness of sugar and calories, again, in the 80s, there was more of a health boom. And that's really when the fitness movement really took off. So people are a little more aware of everything. And baby boomers were now looking for diet versions of, of drinks or lower sugar versions of drinks. And it was thought that their kids would have to be the target market for full sugared versions of those products. And that target was, you know, probably you, if you're from that age range, me specific, you know, as well, that's, I was reading that wheelhouse and they like, we're targeted because Pepsi is killing Coke in our demographic and the young person's market. They're just completely smoking them. So I don't know if you remember the Pepsi 
challenge, the Pepsi taste test and all those commercials and happen. This was like really working because, you know, at the time when there's very few networks uh, and channels on TV, you're seeing everyone's seeing the same commercials and it's making a real, real impact on people. And it's one of the reasons where I've done, I've done an episode all about the history of uh, VHS versus beta in VCRs. And there's always this understanding that beta was a superior format and a better quality version of um, a VCR and the tapes and whatever. And this isn't actually true. We only think that because Sony was able to hammer that in their marketing campaign. And because we're always seeing these same commercials, these ideas just sort of get, you know, beaten into our heads. And that was the case with Pepsi and it was working. So Coke is now, you know, they're looking at market research and they've got a lot of new information and they're aware that they're getting just decimated in the soft drink market. It wasn't just Coke, um, but the whole cola market in general. So people are now wanting diet and they're wanting non-cola soft drinks. Diet Coke is introduced in 1983, actually kind of like 80, late 82, um, but then, you know, amped up and marketed and promoted. And so this was great. This helped, but they really needed to get better control of the full cola market. So they started coming up with some work on a new formula in the early 80s. It was called Project Kansas, not related to the epic band of the same name, but this was kind of like the hidden name as they were working on it. So the focus was creating a sweeter version of Coke, and it did seem to be working. It, it's funny to think of something sweeter, but that was the whole idea. In They were doing taste tests um, with original Coke and Pepsi, and the newer version of Coke seemed to be working with most testers, saying they would buy this if it was a Coca-Cola product. There was a small percentage saying they hated it and were angry at the change. And they even went on to say this might make them stop drinking Coke altogether. And they maybe should have paid attention to that, which we'll get to in a little bit. So a guy named Robert, I never know how to say his name, Robert Goizuda, Goizeta, could be completely butchered, but he was in charge of all this and he was encouraged by all the surveys that they were running and taking and um, everything. So it was now 1985. And this also happens to be not just the year back to the future comes out. This is the hundredth anniversary of the original Coke. Remember it came out in 1885. This seemed like the perfect time to launch this new Coke. It, it was perfect. It, everything seems set up to do it. There was one very crucial piece of data though, that they chose to overlook, but was quite revealing in what was to come. The respondents said they liked the idea of new Coke being a separate product and not a replacement. And this is how things would unravel. But first they have to launch this thing. So new Coke was launched on April 23rd, 1985. You heard that commercial at the start of the show. That was just one of them. They actually stopped making the original formula all together just later in that same week. So this is April 23rd. I think like two or three days later, they just stopped making the original Coke. And here's a lot of interesting stuff as I was researching this that I didn't know happened during those first few weeks. So area manufacturers were using original packaging for new Coke before the new packages were available. The old cans that contain new Coke had gold tops on them. These cans are now actually reused for caffeine-free Diet Coke. If you've ever seen them, that's where those came from. The old bottles with new Coke in them had red caps on them instead of silver and white. Today, all the bottles have red caps, but that's how it was. So as they're launching, the original press conference took place at the Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center, and Pepsi actually <laughs> infiltrates the reporters and they plant people in the crowd to ask questions to throw off the Coke executives, So, which is kind of hilarious, but also showing that Pepsi was clearly nervous about new Coke taking over all the gains they had made in the market. And again, the focus was on sweeter taste. And this was just, it worked well because when you have like an initial drink of something, just a little sip, um, we crave sweetness and you immediately like it and respond to it. You know, the problem is over like the course of a whole drink, it can kind of not work. Have you ever had one of those like fruity type beers that are like a strawberry flavor or raspberry for the first sip or two they're like you're like this is the best drink i've ever had in my life by the end of it you're like i cannot stand this thing um yeah and this was a big focus in the commercials 
though, that their drink was sweeter. And they, you know, looking back now, Bill Cosby was the cornerstone of all this advertising. And uh, he was, I mean, you know, looking <laughs> today, it's, it's hard to even mention the guy's name. But at the time, the Cosby show dominated the 80s. It was the number one show for like almost half of the decade. Like it, it crushed everything. And so they used him to promote it. And the big, the promotion was that Coke's taste um, was sweeter and that it was more, more preferable than Pepsi. And then right off the bat, the initial reaction at first is pretty good. Like I said, it's, it's new, it's sweeter. People like it. The marketing worked and they said that 80% of people that were pulled were aware of new Coke. So they did their job. They got it out there and everyone knew. So the other big thing, again, because of the connection with McDonald's, that was, that really helped the initial sales of new Coke and it showed them to be up 8%, which is massive. And that like, that's within a few weeks. Like that's how well it was working. So, so far, so good. Market research seems to be right on spot on survey said that the majority of people like the new taste three quarters of them said they would buy it again. But as we've seen, polling research doesn't always turn out how the numbers say it will. Um, there was another big question. How would this new Coke go over in the South and the Southeast where Coke originated from? Coke originally comes from Atlanta um, and Georgia and all through the South. I don't know if you're from there, you know this. If not, you you can say, I want a Coke. And that refers to like any soft drink, like Sprite, ginger ale, whatever. It's just sort of synonymous with Coke. Um, so they're wondering how this, I mean, this is a huge part of their market because it, it's kind of at the backbone of, of all the culture with the invention down there. And, you know, it's just kind of part of daily, well, not daily life, but a part of their um, their lives in general. So the backlash starts coming pretty quick. And the people who are enjoying New Coke were really just keeping it to themselves. There's no, there's no way to kind of share that. There's no blogs. There's no forums. There's no internet. There's no way to share what you like. There's no product reviews. You know, there's articles and papers or, you know, it can be little blurbs on TV, but you, you, like, if you like it, no one really knows the people who didn't like it really didn't like it. And they are the ones that turned out to be the vocal majority. These were mainly those Southerners who I just talked about who re like resented the change to something that they held so dear to them. Like they grew up on this. Um, you can mess with a lot of things, but you can't mess with kids on Christmas. Sorry, Home Alone. But I'm you can't mess with, even if it seems stupid, like something that gives people continuity in their lives, something that's always there. Even if it's as simple as like this soft drink, it, it's really important. And this kind of gets out of hand because these Southerners, you, you can read all this if you want to go back into like the um, contemporary articles at the time, but the Southerners were seeing the change in the formula as another surrender to the Yankees. Like, this is terrifying stuff. So the head offices of Coke were in Atlanta. They're getting hammered with calls and complaints. They were receiving, uh, like just within the first few weeks or, or month period, 40,000 calls and letters. And the company hotline they had to set up just for this was getting 1,500 calls a day from irate customers. So it got to the point that Coke hired a psychiatrist to try to analyze the emotions and sentiments in the call. They're like, what the hell is happening here? Why are these people freaking out? They, the psychiatrist concluded people were responding the same way they would when discussing the death of a family member. And this just seems absolutely nuts, but that's the, like what they were hearing and the sentiment in people's voices and the, like the, the words they were using to describe all this, it was the same thing. It's just, when you have something, I mean, nothing makes people panic more than when you have kind of a regularity in their lives and then you take it away. And then that's just what was happening. So, I mean, th this is crazy, crazy stuff. So the problem now is, like I said, you know, no internet, no blogs, tougher to get this stuff out, but now it's starting to get into the mainstream. <clears throat> um, newspapers are picking it up. The a notable ones, the Chicago Tribune that did just a, like, torch coca-cola in articles and then the late night shows get a hold of it and this can be like the kiss of death so like 
Johnny Carson and David Letterman started mocking everything to do with new Coke on a nightly basis. Uh, if you're again, like if you're under 30, it can be hard to imagine that there was a time like we had basically only three networks. There was nothing else to watch on TV, especially late at night. If you were like of age to be able to like watch these shows, like when the tonight show came on with Johnny Carson um, or Letterman, you can like, unless you're watching the news or late sports, like there's a good chance that a third of the viewing country is watching that show, especially Johnny Carson. Anything that like happened on there could change um, perceptions of anything overnight. It's just like, it's hard to explain really how powerful the the medium was at this time. And especially people like that. So say like, especially Johnny Carson and the tonight show being um, the most popular since like so many people are watching this, sh- like the show that any, like say a comedian who has a good set or a, a band that no one's heard of, they have a, a great performance the next day, instantly famous. The whole country knows them. Their careers launch. Like a, a good example is um, Jerry Seinfeld. Like goes on, kills it on his very first performance. He gets the uh, sort of thumbs up a OK sign from Johnny, which doesn't happen a lot, and instantly famous. Gets a whole show. Like you know, careers are launched. You have a bad set, you're screwed. No one ever hears from you again. A few examples of this actually, with how powerful like late night television was in 1966 when Johnny Carson. Um, was, he'd been hosting for a little bit. He plays an unknown game called Twister uh, with Ava Gabor. It sends a scale, the sales skyrocketing and shelves are emptied with Twister. Another example, it was in 1973 and Johnny Carson joked about a shortage of toilet paper and this actually led to panicked buying and hoarding across the whole United States as people emptied out stores and it caused an actual shortage that lasted for weeks just because he was joking. So, So this is the thing now, if these shows are ripping into your new product, everyone is laughing along with it. Uh, You you can be screwed. And that's what's starting to happen with new Coke. And then at the same time, petitions are being started. And, but somehow the sales, except for in the South, were doing pretty good. The worry now was how is new Coke going to do in, and this is very early. Like there, there's no foresight yet. They don't know what's going to happen. The worry now is how new Coke is going to do in the international market. And a lot of countries actually didn't want to bottle this new Coke. The people who actually liked it felt they couldn't share that they did because there was like this peer pressure of that, like you look like an idiot for some reason. So you have all this up against you. So then what's Pepsi's response during all this? They obviously love it and they take advantage of the situation. They would point out in ads that Coke had dropped the ball and new Pepsi drinkers understood why they had made the right choice by avoiding new Coke. And then the funny thing though, is that Pepsi actually didn't pick up that much of the new market. The understanding was that people were more upset by the withdrawal of the old formula than the taste of the new, like people liked the taste It was, it was all right, but they just, they missed the original. Um, that was, that was really the whole debacle. People like, it just comes back to nostalgia. Like this new product's great. They're like, it's amazing. I love it. But you take away something that has like a mainstay in a person's life life. And, um, it's just a panic. It's more than getting used to something. Um, you're, you can't, you can't adopt it into your life. And I think that's the problem again, maybe if it was a separate product. So here's where Coke does the old switcheroo back to old Coke. And, you know, they've got the consumer backlash and even Coke executive executives were wanting a return to the old formula as early as May. This is, this is like a month after new Coke was introduced. So by June, when soft drink sales tend to rise, Coke was starting to level off. So that's not good. The, the flavor was even being adjusted by chemists to try and balance things out and not make it as sweet. They're trying to like get it back to how it was, the company's now running into bottling problems resulting in lawsuits and all, all the wheels are starting to fall off basically. So the tipping point apparently comes when the company president of Coca-Cola had gone to a small restaurant in Monaco and the owner <laughs> proudly said he had original Coca-Cola there and he called it the real thing and offered them chilled glass bottles. So that hurts. 
the the board decided enough was enough and started plans to bring back the old Coke. So on July 11th, this is just 78 days after new Coke was introduced, the world was informed that it would no, it wouldn't be re, uh, it would be no more, and regular Coke would return. And I don't remember this at all. Maybe you do, but Peter Jennings actually interrupted General Hospital on July 11th to uh, with a special bulletin announcing the news that Old Coke was coming back, which is unbelievable. Uh, so New Coke was still kicking around, and it would actually be continued to be um, just called Coca-Cola. In 1992, it actually got renamed Coke 2. I don't know if you remember that at all. I remember this very well. The original formula is now rebrand- rebranded as Coca-Cola Classic. And calling it Classic was a pretty smart move because it helped people to reconnect to the version that they really kept near and dear to their hearts. So the here's kind of the aftermath on all this. The company president had an, a very interesting take here. He said he pointed out that all the research and data in the world could not reveal the deep emotional attachment that people had for the original Coke. You can't test for that. You can't predict it. You don't know how people are, are going to react. The people don't even know how they're going to react to something. And you just, you can't foresee this. So uh, it's not totally related, but it makes me think of that whole, speaking of the Tonight Show earlier, of the whole Tonight Show Conan debacle that happened. I know it's totally unrelated. It just sort of struck that thought in me. So here's a few interesting stats after the return to original Coke, which is now Coca-Cola Classic. At the end of the year, Coca-Cola Classic was outselling New Coke and Pepsi by a massive margin. Six months after the change, Coke sales had increased more than twice the rate of Pepsi. Incredible. The the big thing this also did was an unintentional one. It furthered the gap between Coke and Pepsi. People realized how much nostalgia they felt for Coke, and Pepsi just didn't have that. They just didn't have this history. It really helped cement Coke as the real cola and even more of gave them more of a significant place in the culture. Again, this is all unintended, but another big takeaway was the fact that customers were completely catered for in this situation. It, it, they got exactly what they wanted, and their feelings were not just considered but like completely acknowledged and catered to. So pretty crazy. And the products would continue using the name Coca-Cola Classic up until 2009. Like that's quite a while. Then the word classic was taken off and it was kind of done in a way to give it a bit of a new new branding uh, in 2009. So if you look at it now, there's no classic on it. And th- this is... <laughs> Another interesting fallout from this, which you can read into any way that you want, but this was um, when the removal of Bill Cosby from the long time of advertising with Coke. He said that he found that all his work praising the taste of new Coke (laughs) hurt his credibility. So I'll just leave that right there. Uh, You know, Coke would go on to use the, I don't know if you remember the Red, White, and You campaign. And that was really based around showcasing American virtues and nostalgia and patriotism. And, and Coke was now being associated with this. It was like they were trying to like usurp Budweiser as being, you know, a part of America and everything like that. They also went back to the original intent of New Coke, which was focusing on the youth market that Pepsi had. And they started using um, MT. I don't know if you remember Max Headroom from MTV. They had this whole catch the wave promotion. They were, they were just cracking into the whole, all the work that Pepsi had done, but now they have all, they have so much more momentum behind them and they're able to just sort of dominate the whole market and industry. So starting to slow down here, um, few, <laughs> everyone loves a good conspiracy theory. So here's a few of them that surround the whole thing with new Coke. Kind of, some of them are hard to ignore here, but Here's, here's a couple. So Coke, one of the theories, Coke intentionally changed the flavor, hoping people were going to be upset by it. And in that, they would demand a return to the original formula, and that would make sales spike. And that's exactly what happened, whether this was intended or not. 
The other, uh, another theory that the switch was planned all along to cover the sweetness change from regular sugar to the new super cheap high fructose corn syrup, which is, yeah, is very much sweeter. Um, hundreds of times more actually than like regular sugar. And this was a way to help people transition in. So they created new Coke to do this and get it back um, to the original version, which now, which would be sweeter, but wouldn't seem as sweet as new Coke. That's an interesting one. Uh, Another idea, a theory that they needed to get any rid of the, any connection to the coca and the cocaine. And the DEA was basically trying to get rid of the plant like worldwide and new Coke would contain no cocoa whatsoever, no extract, no synthetic version, whatever, just completely avoid of it. So this in turn, the idea that creating new Coke would please the DEA and essentially Coke would never have to deal with them again. That's a, that's an interesting one that I learned <laughs> researching this. So I don't know if you think that's true or not. Uh, one last conspiracy theory here is Coke wanted to ultimately reveal Pepsi as not being as significant to the culture as Coke was. So even if people were not buying Coke, there was a goal to just have them not buy Pepsi. You know, putting out new Coke was a way for them to be so pissed off that they not only were not buying Coke, but just no colas altogether. And that at least would help cut into the market share and whatever Coke was selling would now essentially their profits would go up. And that happened too. So I don't know if these ideas were, if they're based out anything or if they're just made up after the fact when you can kind of connect the dots, but interesting though. So I'll finish it up here again. Like this is one of my favorite topics just to, to read and research. And there's a lot of good information out there. And to me, it's, it's just a story about nostalgia and public demand, um, marketing oversights and, and lessons also to big time companies. The big takeaway regarding that is to be very careful when messing with an established product. So it's, it's a weird way to look at it because despite its failings, its massive failings at the end of the day, technically new Coke was a success because it helped the company. It increased profits and made them more relevant than ever. And that's a win. It's probably the best case of, uh, a happy accident that had really ever happened in the history of marketing. You know, if you put the Chia Pet as being the first one. So I'll wrap it up there. I mean, again, like if you want to like read the whole article here and look at some of the imaging and some of the commercials and stuff, go to everything 80s podcast.com slash five. Everything's right there, but thank you for listening. I hope you liked it. Uh, if you really like the show, you know, make sure you subscribe so you can get more like it. Check out the other ones. If you really, really like it, give a rating and review. That makes uh, it sure that more people can see it. And again, I'm available wherever you can um, find your podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, the link should be down below to the article. Or if you want to subscribe, all that great stuff. Again, thank you for listening. I'll see you later.